Um, hello and welcome to the IAGHG 12th webinar in our series. My name is Tim Dixon and we're very pleased to have a webinar today on COP22 that will be presented by Arthur Lee. Um, just to give you a very brief uh, introduction to ourselves as the IEA Greenhouse Gas R&D Programme, to give us our full name. We're part of the uh, IEA's Family of Technology Collaboration Programmes uh, since 1991 um, and we exist because of our members, 32 members from 18 countries. We're a technical-based organization, so we don't do policy, but we do policy-relevant information. That's it, thank you. Um, so our main focus of activity through our technical R&D program is on carbon dioxide capture and storage, that's geological storage, covering all aspects of that, from capture to storage and everything else. Um, and we provide our members uh, and our policy audience with independent technical information. We've produced over 300 technical reports now uh, in our history. And we also do other things such as run the GHGT conference series as we just had in Lausanne as well. Uh, this is our membership base. Uh, thank you very much to our members uh, for funding us. Uh, they're very important. They direct our technical program. And what's very important to us also is that our work is used in the appropriate places. And so therefore we are active in the UNFCCC, uh, UNFCCC in the uh, Carbon Sequestration Leadership Forum, in IMO, in ISO, in IPCC, and other forums that uh, are relevant and need our information. So um, today it gives me great pleasure um, to have with us Arthur Lee. Um, he's, <clears throat> he's going to share his views with us today. Arthur Lee is a, a Chevron Fellow and Principal Advisor on Environment and Climate Change. Um, Arthur's bio up there, he's got more than 17 years experience working in energy and greenhouse gas emissions management, um, including the first corporate inventory protocol. Uh, and Arthur's got very many achievements uh, in this area, too many to list here in this summary of bio. But um, to, to point out that he's active, continues to be active in IPCC, he's been active since 2004, um, and he's got both, as well as his industry perspective and credentials, he's also got environmental credentials, formerly working with the uh, API and also in the US EPA on SOX and NOx regulations. Um, Arthur is um, an active member of the International Emissions Trading Association and he's actually a veteran of very many COPs um, and therefore is a respected authority uh, on this subject, on this area and so very well qualified to talk to us today and share his views. And his talk title uh, is From Agreement to Implementation, Impressions and Discussion of COP22 in Marrakesh. Um, please send us your questions uh, online throughout. We will make a record of those and we'll address the questions at the end. And with that, I'd like to hand over to you, Arthur. Thank you. Great. <clears throat> Thank you, uh, Tim, uh, for, that, for that very kind introduction. <clears throat> okay, let me, um, right, let me uh, put up my, uh, my slides here. Okay, uh, can Tim or Sean, can you uh, just say that you can see my screen? Yes, we can see your screen and we can see a small uh, camera image of yourself as well. Right, thank you very much and I'm okay with that. I, I always turn that on deliberately. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Not to do the vanity or anything, but uh, that's actually my microphone as well. That's how my webcam works. Okay. Um, okay. Very good. Uh, so uh, thank you very much, Tim. And uh, and uh, Tim is uh, himself. Uh, uh, even though he's uh, moderating this, Tim was of course also uh, at the uh, at at the COP22 as well as uh, I'm sure several other COPs that I've, I've been I've been at and and I and I've seen him there as well, uh, both as observer and in the past uh, working with the EU uh, as a negotiator. Um, so, uh, so Tim, uh, Tim is uh, himself very well experienced. So, thank you very, very much for that uh, kind introduction. 
Um, I, I do want to uh, give a quick uh, Chevron disclaimer that's uh, in fine print uh, on the foot of the slide. I won't belabor the point. Uh, when I give these talks, uh, or even when I distribute uh, this uh, this stack of slides, is really for information, for discussion only. So all the information analyses uh, insights are are in a sense on my own. Uh, <clears throat> they are not uh, to be construed as um, any Chevron policy, uh, whether retrospective or prospective uh, positioning of Chevron policy, uh, positioning or anything like that. It's really, uh, <clears throat> really, we're very sensitive to that, uh, you know, for, for many years, of course, but uh, uh, very sensitive uh, uh, in, in this time. So anyway, uh, just be sure that I am talking about this as my impressions. Uh, and uh, and I and my role here at Chevron is to contribute to that internal discussion as well. So obviously, what I say, what I say contributes to that, but uh, it, it is by no means anything final uh, from Chevron, any, any anything at all, or even preliminary at this point from Chevron. So anyway, these are just my impressions, and I will say uh, the title uh, my talk uh, gives it away. Uh, the key the key point here, overarching point here, of course. The Paris Agreement uh, was uh, uh, was a very significant uh, milestone, even for somebody like me who's uh, who's been observing this for I think over um, I think this was either my yeah it's my 17th COP. Uh, 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 I, I, it wasn't completely continuous, uh, but 17th COP, and in fact uh, one of the COPs I I missed uh, was in fact the uh, COP seven. I think it was COP7 in Marrakesh, uh, so so I actually missed the very first uh, first COP that was held in Marrakesh, and uh, uh, I had to catch up with all of that uh, significant development because Marrakesh was actually a very significant one uh, after the Kyoto Protocol, which was of course COP3. Uh, the Kyoto Protocol after it was agreed to, uh, again very significant, just like Paris. Uh, it took about um, uh, four years then, uh, from three to COP seven, COP three to COP seven took about four years for the clean development mechanism uh, under the rubric or the label of uh, Marrakesh Accords uh, was actually um, uh, then agreed to. So, so if uh, history is any guide, uh, these negotiations, as you can see, or as we have already seen uh, in history, it takes uh, it took four years to uh, really look at the details of uh, Article 12, for example. Article 12 is Article 12 of the Kyoto Protocol. Um, I know a lot of you don't uh, don't uh, uh, might not know what that is. That, that was the clean development mechanism. So Article 12 uh, took four, uh, literally four years for negotiations of the details uh, to get to uh, to get to Marrakesh, and that's when Marrakesh was signed. Uh, and there were many details, you know. Uh, because uh, because th those details uh, uh, talk about uh, how to operationalize all the modalities and procedures, so to speak. In fact, how we say it in, in the company would be that the how and why, and the how and the who, and the systems that would that would take place in order to implement the clean development mechanism. Now, all that is uh, a lot of history. Uh, it, now, it's not that the CDM itself, the clean development mechanism, the CDM is not dead. By any means, uh, in fact, it still uh, it still exists not only on paper, and there is still a CDM executive board, and there are still projects that are operating, of course. Um, and in fact, one of the tracks, uh, small tracks now in negotiations, is actually about the CDM in these negotiations. Now, I didn't, I did not personally uh, participate or observe those, but uh, certainly hearing hearing from some of the other participants, uh, some of my business colleagues who attended those. Uh, it's, still, it's still alive, it's still uh, kicking, so to speak, uh, and it's still going through uh, its motions of, uh, of, of, uh, of negotiations because, uh, uh, because it is still, uh, the Kyoto Protocol, of course, uh, is being, still being amended. <clears throat> the Doha Amendment back in, uh, I was uh, agreed to and back in COP, uh, uh, what was that? COP uh, 18, I think. Uh, no, COP 18 was Durban, sorry. So it was, it was COP uh, uh, 17 in Durban. 
Doha Man was COP17, sorry, was when when the Kyoto Protocol was extended to um, to uh, um, to 2020, and that's why the CDM is technically still there and uh, still operating. So anyway, that's a, l a lot of the history, and I, I know uh, I'm not supposed to talk about I'm supposed to talk about what's happening now, but but it's very interesting for me, uh, so, someone who has seen all this, to see some of these history and to uh, reflect on how they, they have worked in the past. Uh, again, not necessarily that that's how they will work again now in the future, but uh, some of it, uh, at least, uh, is coming back. And of course, uh, the process itself is fairly enduring in that sense, uh, that countries do, do uh, things in a certain way and take certain time, uh, the speed in which they talk about these things. So anyway, let me uh, move on. Um, Oh, oh, I should say one thing, one quick thing. Uh, the official time, of course, for uh, these negotiations was actually from the 7th to the 18th of November. Um, but as, I, as, as I've as i observed in uh, almost all of these, uh, I don't think I've ever seen one that ended on time. It actually extended into the uh, 2 or 3 a.m. hour of uh, the 19th of November. So anyway, these negotiations always uh, seem to have... Uh, exceeded his uh, Friday night deadlines. <clears throat> okay, so uh, the COP22, uh, of course, following on to the Paris Agreement, COP21, um, as many people have said, and, as, uh, and in, the, in my observations, at, at least uh, in meetings and briefings with, uh, held by three delegations uh, in, in the conference, uh, the w same words, uh, uh, or very similar words, were used, workmanlike. Okay, so workmanlike was the pace and the achievements uh, in the negotiation, the agreements that were made, the decisions. So, uh, so the cut point here was workmanlike, and it was expected to be like that. Uh, and uh, they, I guess, the negotiator, negotiators uh, more or less fulfilled that that description. They, they. Uh, they really did achieve a series of decisions, um, which I'll get to in a minute. Uh, but of course, at the same time, on the Wednesday, uh, when Tim and I were both there, on Wednesday, uh, uh, sorry, uh, yeah, Tim was not there, but, but on Wednesday of that first week, um, uh, was uh, when we all found out the U.S. elections, uh, the results of them, uh, and of course, uh, you, you all know where you were. Um, and, um, and the U.S. elections, um, of course, now introduced an element of uncertainty into the negotiation. Now, the, uh, uh, having said that, of course, the delegation is uh, uh, the appointees, the political appoint appointees in the, the, the leadership of the delegation are, of course, from the current administration. Uh, even though uh, they, they would not be uh, expected to... Uh, to do a lot more uh, in terms of uh, policy direction of their negotiations, uh, they would still uh, be more in a maintenance mode of uh, negotiations, and that was, uh, and that seemed uh, fairly clear to me. Uh, that's what happened. Uh, but at the same time, uh, it was uh, still very much workmanlike, as, as I said, and uh, and I saw, I think uh, from what I could see and from the briefings, uh, they still, of course, uh, negotiate negotiated, at least on the U.S., on behalf of the U.S., uh, very uh, hard for uh, to keeping the Paris Agreement uh, the, the way it was intended in terms of uh, of, uh, of, of developing countries uh, and, all, and developed nations, all of them are subject to the same agreement in terms of reporting, transparent, sorry, transparency uh, and all that. Uh, and uh, and not to uh, not to back away from that. Uh, so I so that was very much noted, uh, and the U.S. delegation I think very much uh, did that to try to maintain that and not have the Paris Agreement fall back into much more of a uh, into into the Kyoto Protocol of uh, of a very bright line, very strict dichotomy between nations. Um, so anyway, uh, <clears throat> I think, uh, to say the least, it was uh, it was uh, 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 an element of uncertainty in negotiation. But at the same time, uh, countries did 
continue. Uh, there was no let up uh, in the pace of the negotiations and, uh, and it ended the way it did uh, on the 19th of November. Uh, mainly, uh, I, I think the overall uh, achievement of this um, is that uh, the nations did agree to more or less a two-year work plan for many issues. Um, let, let me let me uh, uh, back up just a minute here in terms of um, uh, so there was there was of course this procedural issue that the uh, Paris Agreement created uh, the, the entry into force of the Paris Agreement created. Um, it was a surprise to uh, many folks um, that uh, well. I should say there was a mixed uh, thing here. It's, uh, it, it was both a uh, expected uh, that there was a lot of momentum since Paris, since December of 2015, that there would be a lot of momentum to uh, to uh, to ratify uh, the uh, the agreement, but at the same time, um, uh, people were always realistic, and and I think the decisions itself in COP22, of course, the decision called for a two-year period. Uh, of signature, uh, well, one year of signature, but at least two years of uh, of, um, of work, uh, even at the time of expected work. Uh, so it was it was kind of interesting that um, that when the uh, when the 55% uh, uh, emissions threshold and of course uh, uh, more than 55 countries uh, ratified the uh, Paris Agreement back on uh, October. That of course, 30 days later, uh, which was uh, for, for November of uh, 2016, the 30 days later, the Paris Agreement actually came into force. So it was uh, somewhat of a surprise to uh, to many countries um, uh, that made the decision back in Paris to give themselves two years of time, and that that was two years of time basically reflected in what's called the uh, ad hoc working group on the Paris Agreement or the APA. Um, I didn't. I did not uh, uh, make the acronym here, but it's called the APA. So, uh, so the way, of course, these uh, uh, these agreements work is well. Anyway, I'll explain that in, in a minute. But so it's two, so two years. Uh, there was supposed to be two years of work that the APA or the ad hoc working group on the Paris Agreement was supposed to have uh, to uh, to do a lot of the work to prepare for the entry into force of the Paris Agreement. Uh, and so at the at the meeting, um, it was uh, became a little bit of a procedural uh, procedural uh, problem. I, I wouldn't say it's a, 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 a huge problem, uh, but uh, not all not all the countries that said that uh, that have that have submitted their uh, uh, their in, uh, uh, intended nationally determined contributions or NDCs. Not all of them have yet ratified by November fourth when. Everyone met in Marrakesh. Uh, sorry, when when uh, everyone started to come and meet in Marrakesh on the seventh. So by the time I think of the opening of the COP 22, there were there were about 90, 95, I think 95 nations. And at the end of the COP, there was about uh, there were about 110 or 113, maybe even uh, nations have ratified. So anyway, it's not exactly the 180. 184 plus or 190 or so uh, uh, nations of the convention. Okay, again, the Paris Agreement, of course, falls under as one of the protocols or daughter agreements uh, that that comes from the uh, uh, comes from the UN Convention. All right, so so let me uh, let me then uh, say that uh, that uh, to cut the long cut the long story already long story short. The APA was supposed to have two years of work, and so uh, at the end of the day, uh, on the 19th, uh, uh, the COP did agree that the EPA should have that two year again, of course, of work to do a lot of these issues. Oh, uh, I should have said too that in 2017 um, there will be the uh, the meeting, the first meeting of the Paris Agreement uh, was opened uh, at this meeting. Uh, that's the procedural fix uh, that nations had to agree to. For many of us, of course, as uh, who are practical folks uh, dealing with technology matters and all that, it's, this all seems uh, a little bit uh, uh, highly procedural. But but they had to do that in, ter in terms of uh, for the agreement. So they open up the CMA, the uh, the what's called the uh, uh, conference of parties serving as the first as the meeting of the Paris Agreement, 
so th this was the first meeting in Marrakesh. Uh, so procedurally, they had to suspend it, and they have to c continue to call this a CMA-1 until the APA finishes its work. So it's both procedural and sort of a nomenclature kind of thing. That uh, in 2017, the, uh, they will resume, resume the CMA-1 as CMA-1 continued. Uh, and they will uh, check on progress uh, in the next COP. Uh, and then when it meets again in 2018, uh, they will, uh, it will be completion. Uh, the APA should have done by then all of its work. Okay. Sorry, uh, that was a long explanation for a procedural issue, but uh, I have to get through that. Now, it is uh, important to understand what these what some of these areas are, and um, and I have to say I, I'm only, of course, one person, and uh, I, I kind of depend on some of the meetings that we ha have with business colleagues to understand what um, what some of the other areas are, but these are the issues, uh, some some of the more notable decisions, as I call them, uh, that were agreed to, uh, to be worked on for two years. Uh, nationally determined contributions, of course, as I said just a few minutes ago, uh, INDCs are what were submitted prior to Paris Agreement. Uh, but now uh, countries are really, uh, after the APA finishes work, really are uh, supposed to uh, turn those INDCs uh, into, uh, into more meaningful uh, uh, NDCs. In fact, I think um, technically, and I, and I don't recall exactly the words, but uh, technically as the Paris Agreement has come into force, the INDCs no longer are intended. They really are, should be called NDCs now. Okay, so, so in, in, my, uh, in my talks these days and in my conversation with people, I have to uh, delete myself the word intended. Uh, it's actually nationally determined contribution now. Now, how, how these in the future will be submitted, uh, the format and the, and the kind of uh, format that's important and the content, of course, of these NDCs, also very important, I think that what the APA announced alone in order to determine uh, uh, is not uh, uh, and how uh, countries are supposed to do these NDCs. At the same time, these rules themselves and the reporting provision like transparency, uh, they are mandatory, actually. They are mandatory. Okay. Um, and the global stock take itself is mandatory. It is enshrined in uh, Article 14 of the Paris Agreement, and that's every five years. Uh, in fact, that's one of the uh, areas that I managed to follow a little bit. Uh, not, not I couldn't, uh, I couldn't see all the meetings. Uh, many of the meetings were closed, but, uh, but I was able to uh, uh, go in and listen to uh, some of the meetings. Uh, global stock takes every five years, and. Um, and a lot of details need to uh, be uh, fleshed out. So, of course, when they need to be fleshed out, it needs the countries uh, to negotiate what those details are. Uh, there's an enhanced technology framework now from the Paris Agreement. That, too, uh, received a lot of negotiations um, as well, linking, te linking technology and finance, uh, tightening that linkage. Uh, that too uh, was. Uh, that's in fact one of the areas I did try to follow, uh, along with the technology framework and cooperative approaches, um, also known in the business community as uh, market-based mechanisms or market approaches, and also uh, non-market approaches. As you recall in the Paris Agreement, um, uh, the Article Six uh, very much was um, uh, for many of us in the business community. A, uh, more of a pleasant surprise in, in that, um, in that uh, nations actually did agree to, uh, to market-based mechanisms, uh, which to many of us, of course, means that it, is, it, is, it allows uh, not only companies but also countries to be able to uh, uh, seek the lowest cost uh, reductions uh, as CO2 is much more of a global, uh, global of course, is greenhouse gas, global globally distributed, so uh, it should be allowed that uh, emission reduction can take place anywhere that allows lowest cost. So market mechanisms tend to be able to do that well, it is well designed to allow uh, lowest cost uh, compliance by not only companies but countries. Uh, and of course, uh, as a compromise, uh, uh, 
one of the paragraphs in Article 6 uh, did uh, lay out very key uh, key provision for non-market approaches, and all that has to be worked out as well. Okay, um, I, I don't intend this to be a, a, a tutorial by any means, but uh, when we go to these negotiations, uh, it is um, it's all, my very first uh, couple of years, uh, or a few years in fact, I don't think I ever got used to this until uh, several years later. Um, it's really com complicated, very complex. It's the same people, but how these people, these negotiators, how they organize themselves, that's always the important point. Uh, just like we in the EXCO uh, and the IA EXCO have, uh, have to organize ourselves uh, uh, into various uh, uh, groups uh, sometimes. Um, the the, um, the the conference of parties is literally all the negotiators, uh, but at the same time they also uh, divide themselves up and have d d different experts from their own de uh, national delegations to then negotiate on various types of issues. So there's there's a group called subsidiary body on scientific technology technological advice SUBSTA, and then there's some something called the subsidiary body on implementation. They do a lot of so-called implementation kind of uh, procedural kind of uh, discussion. Uh, Substance is where we've of, often focused our work, people like myself, like Tim Dixon, uh, especially in the last several years, uh, uh, not, not so recently, but in the last several years when Tim and I and others uh, had to really work on the uh, CCS in CDM issue, There's allowing CCS eligibility in the clean development mechanism. Much of that discussion was really focused in substance. Okay, so that's one track of negotiation. Those are different tracks. The Kyoto Protocol, protocol as I said, remains. It is still a track of negotiations and it continues. Um, and it continues under the um, uh, umbrella uh, name, I guess, uh, the, the name of the CMP. CMP itself is a conference of parties serving as meeting of the parties of the Kyoto Protocol. So, so the CMP it's, uh, has its own um, uh, track. Uh, the Paris Agreement uh, now, as I uh, explained already, is uh, under the APA to work out a lot of the details, and the CMA is um, has met already, as I said, and will re uh, meet again, uh, suspended, and will resume again in 2017. Okay, so uh, actually 112 parties here is uh, as of November 21st. Uh, I noted here 112 parties have ratified. So anyway, uh, let's let me move on. Uh, these are some of the things I actually personally attended, so so I am able to take pictures, take photos. Uh, you know, the UN does allow uh, photos. Uh, uh, it does not always allow video. Uh, I think, um, and certainly, uh, certainly at the discretion of any event organizer. Many of these events are open. Uh, some are not. Uh, well, actually, I should say many are not open. Uh, uh, many are open. Um, uh, I won't give percentages, but. Uh, Here's a side event that uh, the governments of Australia and the government of the government of Australia and government of the United Kingdom uh, wanted a lot of people to come, uh, and so uh, so there were quite a few. Uh, it was packed, um, and it was where the uh, the two governments uh, leading other OECD countries uh, worked on this thing called the hundred dollar billion uh, hundred billion dollar roadmap, and was at launched it officially at the side event at COP. Okay. The next couple of slides um, uh, detail some of this analysis. It's really an analysis based on the, uh, the OECD and OECD analysis that was released back in uh, back earlier this year and and was uh, launched uh, uh, by the uh, uh, by two governments, Australia and UK. Um, so I, I won't belabor the point here, but uh, there was a decision. Uh, in fact, the decision was back in, uh, I think it was Paris, or it might even have been Lima, but anyway, it might have been uh, uh, some decision in Lima, which led to a final decision in, uh, in Paris, that in order to build trust between countries, uh, that the that the nations that were formerly under the Annex 1, uh, well, they're still under Annex 1, uh, under the UN Convention, um, would undertake um, an analysis, uh, what, what we call roadmap here, but it's really uh, it turns into analysis about where the sources of financing might come from, uh, 
that was uh, in the um, uh, in the uh, in the agreement. Uh, as you recall, the Paris Agreement uh, uh, does call for finance. Of course, um, is in one of the articles. I think uh, uh, Article Five, I believe. Uh, but anyway, um, no, not Article Five. But anyway, the uh, the, the finance is. Uh, uh, there was a decision decision taken to have a hundred billion dollars uh, at least um, per uh, by twenty by the year twenty twenty. Um, to mobilize by, by the year 2020, and then um, in in COP, at COP 21, uh, the decision was to then have a, a floor of 100 billion dollars. So that means a um, a uh, negotiation will have to take place now around what that higher number would be um, uh, for uh, for assistance of uh, mobilizing uh, more than 100 billion dollars um, to to nations. So, uh, so this roadmap was uh, an attempt by the uh, uh, countries uh, that are willing to do uh, that are willing to uh, uh, contribute to this uh, to do this analysis, and they uh, and they and they were able to to analyze and and uh, categorize some sources of uh, of funds, as you can see here. Okay, I won't uh, I won't get into too much here. A lot of it is public finance, but of course, mobilizing could also mean the private sector. I think the the um, the important point here is that uh, uh, let me skip this slide. Actually, um, these are just some of the nations that have already announced announced their contributions. Um, I, I've only selected a few here uh, just for uh, matter of not not being so so exhaustive, but uh, just to highlight some of the countries that were. Um, they were very active in in this road mapping exercise. Australia, UK, of course, uh, EU as well, uh, and and the US did some work as well, and uh, and the dollar amount there. Now I, I put that up there, of course, uh, with the the, the US elections. Uh, it's not clear what that means now for US contribution. Okay, so the the heart of the analysis to me is actually this. Uh, other people may find other interesting um, aspects of the roadmap, but uh, but it's really um, uh, in one of the previous slides I showed you the 66 billion dollars. Um, that's that would be for 2020. Uh, what what the analysis is uh, the road mapping exercise uh, really came up with is that yes, um, countries due to uh, what they can see now in the analysis can perhaps come up with 66 billion. Uh, it's not 100 billion, of course. But there's also the private sector uh, involvement that uh, governments believe uh, that, uh, and all uh, governments believe that they can they can get uh, to mobilize from the private sector, from multilateral uh, banks and agencies, and uh, and they cited some historical uh, data, and also uh, the fact that uh, that they would project certain ratios of leverage, and so th therefore uh, looking at that. The roadmap uh, then uh, uh, basically asserted the claim that uh, they are able to uh, do uh, the $100 billion number uh, and, and then possibly greater. So, so this is really, to me, the core of the analysis. Okay. All right. Um, a lot of these are details, and I don't know how much I really want to get into, but, um, but perhaps uh, I, I don't know whether this was actually sent out to you, but... Uh, uh, but if not, uh, let me just highlight a few things. Um, again, as I said, uh, uh, this is really the beginning of a two-year work plan. Uh, one of the areas I do follow more closely is uh, is the technology framework. Um, as I understand it, the technology mechanism, of course, already exists. But what is this uh, enhanced technology framework? It's uh, that was actually enshrined in Article 10 of the Paris Agreement. Uh, actually, not too many people understood what that was, even some of the negotiators, uh, because the technology mechanism already exists and it's been operationalized. There are two arms of it. Uh, there's the Technology Executive Committee, and there's also the um, uh, Climate Technology Center and Network, uh, which is actually housed or, or based in um, Copenhagen and has a secretariat now uh, and a director and staff. Uh, so the CTCN uh, is country-driven. Uh, it uh, it received re requests 
In fact, it encourages requests for assistance on technology uh, needs assessment, technology, uh, so any kind of assistance and analysis of technology needs, basically, and uh, and and development uh, and assistance towards uh, any kind of development. Now, the the amount that it gives is uh, I think only a quarter million dollars at uh, at, at max. I think I believe. Um, Tim may actually have a little bit insight, more insight on that because of the some of the CCS issues as well. Uh, but uh, but anyway, the the technology framework um, uh, is is meant to meant to enhance the work of both the technology executive committee and and the CTC. And now enhancing what does that mean? Is to perhaps give greater guidance uh, to some negotiators. Uh, I get the sense that. Uh, Especially to those from uh, the developing world, it's really more about um, tightening that linkage uh, with finance and uh, so that's item five here on the screen here. Item five, whenever you see the word support, um, it does literally mean there's a word finance in front of it, financial support. Um, of course, there's also uh, capability or organizational capability that kind of support as well. Uh, item three does have capacity building and Enabling environments, okay. Enabling environments often mean the um, the kind of um, uh, the kind of uh, laws and uh, laws and uh, uh, regulations and other um, uh, and, and also uh, universities, academia, the kind of literally the enable, enabling environments in the country that allows innovation, technology development, uh, deployment to occur. Okay. So these are the five elements. Of what enhancing the technology framework means, so that's what the uh, the negotiators it took them it took them a week um, on this to uh, to negotiate. Uh, I think a little bit more than six hours of total negotiation time, but they were able to come up with these five elements, uh, and you can read it for yourself: innovation, implementation, and I explained some of them already. Uh, enabling environments, I, I will say, is a, a sensitive matter for uh, for many uh, countries, uh, in especially developed uh, nations, um, where um, where the intellectual property rights uh, (IPR) uh, are, are are very seriously enforced. Now, I'm not saying that uh, other countries don't do that. Uh, it is. But it is an issue that uh, has been pushed by uh, nations like India, uh, like China, uh, that are that have opposing views about some of these issues. Okay, about uh, IPR issues. I will leave it at that. So there are uh, countries. Countries do differ on these on issues of intellectual property rights uh, fairly significantly. Almost in some ways diametrically opposed. Okay. Uh, so for many of us in the private sector, this is actually a very important issue uh, when it comes to technology development. Uh, there's linkage uh, to the financial mechanism. There was decisions decisions were uh, written down and agreed to in the Paris uh, to conti continue to continue to link this. Sorry, link, link the financial mechanism. The financial mechanism, uh, uh, literally, in I think UN term terminology. Uh, uh, points to two uh, two bodies uh, that uh, that have secretariats. Uh, Global Environment Facility is uh, basically has a has a secretariat or uh, or staff uh, at the World Bank, um, and the Green Climate Fund, which is now of course has a secretariat, I believe based in uh, South Korea, uh, in Seoul, in fact. So so these two these two are really the key parts of the key operating entities of the financial mechanism. So there were a lot of discussion, uh, and I and I would say, of all the technology-related negotiation, technology negotiations themselves themselves were were difficult. Uh, although they did get through it uh, very well and finally had agreement, the the linking uh, discussion was much more difficult, uh, and it it really took uh, a lot of uh, overtime work, um, overtime. Not that it was it extended beyond the COP itself, but overtime work, uh, late evening work by negotiators. The negotiators uh, have had a lot of bilaterals and informal, informal consultations. 
Uh, that sounds funny, but uh, they actually they actually do have these names. Uh, it means something to the negotiators. Informal, informal actually mean countries get together with no UN support, no UN staff present, and they literally get around a table or in the hallway or in a room and talk and talk and try to work out some language, work out some text. Okay? So informal informals are, uh, or actually there were quite a few to take place under this negotiation. So anyway, at the end of the day, uh, they did a reach agreement uh, and uh, there were words that, uh, that tied these two uh, mechanisms closer together so that, uh, for example, the, uh, the chairs of one group uh, the, uh, the chairs or co-chairs of one group would be able to visit and meet, uh, participate in the meetings of another group, so that at the chair level there will be a greater um, uh, personal participation between the bodies, and that the reports, for example, of the uh, I didn't even list the uh, there was one other group called the Standing Committee on Finance or the SCF. The uh, SCF has been now in pr some in practice uh, in practice in practical terms have been sharing and asking for input from, for example, the Technology Executive Committee, the TEC, uh, the tech. So, so that kind of uh, uh, um, more formal uh, linkages are now occurring and, and have been uh, enshrined in, uh, in, in, these, in this agreement um, uh, in COP22. Okay. Uh, it's, uh, of course, anything between countries is very formal, and that's why, as a business person, I always find those uh, Negotiations are very interesting in the sense that um, that it is so formal <laughs> that they, they, they cannot even talk to each other without uh, agreeing to it first. So, um, okay, the APA. I think I already mentioned a lot about this. Uh, I won't uh, uh, say too much here. Uh, I think. Um, oh, I will say one thing here. Um, I already talked about INDCs. Um, I think this accounting. There's this issue on accounting, okay? Providing existing approaches and legal instruments to apply the accounting of NDCs. <clears throat> accounting is very important, uh, obviously, um, to uh, all of us, uh, whether in business or in government. But accounting in the these NDCs are now even more important because of contributions, okay? Um, I can hear, uh, uh, I think, probably Tim wanting me to stop. So let me let me do uh, do uh, uh, maybe close with. Uh, oh, we've, with we've got about five minutes more for you to continue, Arthur, and then okay. we'll take questions. Okay, all right, very good. Thank you, Tim. I will say one thing here: the compliance committee is uh, is actually taking on. Uh, sorry, accounting is very important, so I'll, I'll just leave it at that. Adaptation too is very important, I think, for many countries and for many of us in industry. Um, uh, transparency frame, framework again, not just accounting, but then now how do you report it? How do you share between countries what you're doing, and of course then uh, and being able to verify some of that uh, during the global stock take. The global stock take is one of the areas that I tried to follow a little bit closer, closely, even though I couldn't attend all the meetings. But the procedures, measures, governance, all that are how have we worked out? Okay. The compliance committee. Uh, I, the way the reason I even noted this is is that. Uh, I had not realized the importance of this uh, committee until uh, until perhaps this COP. Uh, if this COP, this committee will be responsible for for recommendation to individual countries about their achievements of goals and NDCs. Okay. Uh, I know compliance sounds like a very very harsh word, uh, uh, but it is it is very much uh, already enshrined in the agreement uh, that ex it's an expert based committee. It's supposed to facilitate. It's not supposed to punish. Non-punitive, non-adversarial. Okay. So it has become uh, more important in the negotiation. All right, uh, I think NDCs I already said this, <clears throat> um, but uh, just to reiterate a quick point here, it's really a lot of accounting, a lot of transparency. So what are the? So these are key questions that countries are now being asked, and they have to submit their views. And by 2017, they have complete again. Uh, sorry, not complete, but at least make some progress towards um, an agreement on what these future NDCs ought to look like. Okay. Uh, transparency, again, is very important. So uh, let me just leave it at that. Uh, global stock take every five years. Uh, these are just some, and not all, of the information sources that will be needed. And, and this is just one area. Okay. The procedure, 
uh, I didn't even list all the procedural questions that had to be asked. But even the sources of information, such as uh, from the IAGHG, for example, okay? I think that, it, hopefully, I think it is covered in here, and I believe the sources that are reputable and all that certainly uh, would be. Uh, but we have to make sure, I think we do have to make sure that IAGHG information will be taken uh, into account, will be serious. So that's how some of this work, I think, in observing these negotiations actually then tie back to uh, to what we do here as part of EXCO and as part of uh, part of the uh, overall IHH uh, work that, uh, that, that, that we all support. Okay. Uh, I won't talk too much about this, but of course trading between countries or between companies obviously need to have environmental integrity and, and robust accounting. So uh, the main issues here have to do with whether <coughs> some countries view that this again will be like the CDM and have a central centralized UN governance body uh, or not. And, and uh, some people have been interpreting the, the Article 6 as having two kinds of uh, co uh, sorry, two kinds of market-based approaches, uh, but for some countries there's only one kind. Okay, so there's already very extreme position being taken. Uh, as in any negotiation, people are taking the corners taking corners in the, in, the, uh, 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 in the negotiations, and hopefully um, they'll meet somewhere in the middle. But right now, uh, it's already been reset, uh, and that's another thing. Um, you know, after Paris, a lot of countries would like to fall back on some of the pre-Paris negotiating positions, and some of them have. Um, so this is partly some of that. All right, uh, I won't say too much about this, but uh, you, you probably have read all this. Uh, on the morning after the elections, uh, uh, in discussion with some of my colleagues already, I, I tried to answer this question for myself that very early morning. And, um, and uh, how would technically, I'm not saying the U.S. will do this, but uh, how would technically the U.S. Uh, withdraw from uh, the Paris Agreement? Obviously, the U.S. is already in it, and uh, so it would take at least three um, at least three years, in my view, to do that. Now, uh, of course, there is a, a faster way to do this for the U U.S. technically, is uh, just simply withdraw from the U.N. Framework Convention itself, the overall thing, uh, that's Article 25, because at any time, three years, after three years from the day on which the convention has entered into force, that's already happened, of course, uh, this was 1994, okay? So, uh, so the U.S. can uh, any such withdrawal shall take effect upon expiry, uh, expiry of one year from the date of receipt. So any time, the uh, U.S. can, uh, you know, on J J January 21st even, say send in a letter to the U.N. General Secretary and say we'll, uh, the U.S. withdraws, then it would be a year from uh, January. So, uh, so it is technically very, very quickly, it can be done very quickly and efficiently. Okay? So uh, this is what uh, my technical analysis shows, and I'm not saying anything about anything political or policy-wise, okay? Uh, many side events here. Uh, let me just skip to the one that I know, uh, I know uh, this is very much an IEA, Greenhouse Gas, University of Texas, Austin, Bureau of Economic Technology, and Geonet. And, um, and Tim Dixon, uh, our moderator here, is uh, very much a force behind that, driving this uh, the organization of this as well as uh, assisting, contributing with the other partners to the booth that we have, the display area that IAGH has. I don't have a picture photo here, but I tweeted one of those photos uh, showing uh, Niels Paulson here. And I tweeted photos of, um, of both uh, uh, Tim, and, and, um, uh, Tim and also Catherine Romanek from the University of Texas. But, uh, but this the side event was focused on, um, on, on the potential opportunities in Nigeria. All right, let me uh, just, uh, I think, close out. I, the other side events, oh, this one is perhaps uh, somewhat important about CTCN and about the, uh, the technology mechanism. Um, I will say one thing, that the CTCN, again, this country-driven process, it has received uh, 158 requests uh, and, and growing for technical assistance. Uh, but a lot of the work is really about design. It's, it's what we would call a lot of paperwork. All, it's all paperwork. There's nothing on the ground really uh, that's happening. Um, but, but what's the uh, progress, I think, is uh, that there are now 155 nationally designated entities 
uh, literally at, in, under these UN agreements, you have to have country point of contacts, and that's what they're called. They're really, they're really point of contacts um, with the CTCN, and those folks are the ones who channel their national requests to the CTCN in order to uh, get help. Okay. And uh, okay, so I'll leave it at that. Uh, Tim, please, uh, okay. back to you. Thank you very much, Arthur. And uh, well done, because it's a very complex um, set of constructions and negotiations and mechanisms and streams, etc. We have a little bit of time for questions. Um, and we have one on the NDCs. And what happens if a country does not comply with what they've promised in their NDC? Uh, I, you know, I, I think that's what the Compliance Committee is supposed to do. Um, you know, as I said, uh, I didn't actually follow, uh, and it hasn't dawned on me that the importance of this committee, um, uh, simply being that uh, I've, I've always viewed, and, and I think most people have viewed the Paris Agreement so far as a voluntary architecture with overlay with some mandatory elements, and those mandatory elements really are focused on um, on transparency and on global stock take. Okay. So if a country says, simply says they, they, they don't need to comply anymore uh, and they just uh, perhaps even withdraw or ignore their, uh, their NDCs, uh, this committee would make a recommendation, um, as I said here. In fact, I think I actually uh, quoted this. I should have put quotes around here. Uh, that's transparent, non-adversary, and non-punitive. So now, I don't know what that means because the compliance committee rules and uh, modalities and procedures themselves are being negotiated at this point. So, okay. Thank you, um, thank you for that question. In, in general, Arthur, um, with carbon capture and storage, um, the IPCC tells us its role, uh, how much is needed, but what do these negotiations and process uh, progress here, what, what are the implications for CCS? And for example, does the Green Climate Fund, is that able to fund? Uh, CCS projects, and we had a question on that from India. Right. I uh, I have to admit I'm not. Uh, I don't follow the Green Climate Fund, uh, the, the detailed development of Green Climate Fund too closely. I do know that in one of its governing documents, uh, CCS is included as a project. is is mentioned, and uh, I I don't know exactly what how it's mentioned, but it's certainly, as I understand it, has been uh, has been uh, uh, eligible uh, in the governance document. I could be wrong there, but at the same time, I, I also would note for you that um, uh, that CCS, in, uh, as I said earlier, the clean development mechanism, uh, it would continue to exist as long as the Kyoto Protocol is exists up to 2020. Now, uh, it it. It does need the Doha Amendment to be ratified, which is why uh, the UN Secretariat, the uh, UNFCCC Sec Secretariat, continues to call for governments to please, please come in and uh, and you know sign your name on the dotted line and and uh, ratify the Doha Amendment. Because with the Doha Amendment, then then the um, CDM itself could uh, remain in place until 2020. So anyway. Uh, CCS is still in the CDM. Uh, those rules haven't disappeared. And of course, as, uh, as, uh, as I think both Tim and I, perhaps even Tim can help me out here, <laughs> CCS is very much uh, still in the IPCC, uh, sorry, the IPCC uh, uh, Chapter 5 of the uh, um, Chapter 5 of the Energy Volume, I think. Yes. Um, Spelled out National Inventories, right. Yes. That's right, Tim. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, and and that, those inventories, as long if they, if they, uh, if the CCS, if a country does apply any kind of CCS, as long as they follow those inventory uh, procedures uh, that the IPCC put out in 2006, uh, the CCS should be able to count uh, under a national emission inventory of that country. And of course, if it counts under the national emission inventory of a country, then that means if that country has an NDC that that does allow for a CCS project, then of course the NDC follow the uh, inventory. Pro, it, you know, the nation follows its own national inventory process, which follows the IPCC. Then, of course, it should be eligible for uh, uh, to be recognized as any kind of progress under the NDC. So, so I'll just leave it at that. I uh, I think it's uh, 
there's still some issues, of course, with the CDM, which um, it, it may survive, may not survive, and there's all sorts of issues with whether this Article 6 in, under the Paris Agreement could grow out of a, a CDM, or it could be a whole new mechanism that does not take on some of the uh, vestiges of the CDM, or not. Uh, yep. no. Okay. Not okay. Thanks, Arthur. Anyway, uh, thanks. Yes. And, and I think you're, you're absolutely right. And I, I think the Article 6 mechanisms are seeking to learn from the experiences of running the CDM uh, as well. Um, Arthur, I think we've actually come to the time and we get cut off after one hour uh, on the webinar system here. So we've taken some questions and those questions that we've not been able to get to, we'll draft answers and respond to those people afterwards. Um, but uh, just uh, reiterate what you said. It's very important, I think, that we provide information. Um, and th thank you for making that point. It's, it's really important that knowledge about CCS and what it can do is made available, uh, as well as all the other low carbon technologies. And the role of ourselves, um, the Chevron, the CO2 capture project, who did have their own side event that Arthur uh, jumped over in the slides, and the Global CCS Institute and CO2 Geonet, the University of Texas, um, CCSA. It's all very important that um, we, uh, we work together in providing information, and it's very much needed there. Um, Arthur, I really appreciate you uh, sharing today with our audience your views. You've got an excellent history and perspective on all of the COPs and the detail that goes on and the implications of that. I also very much appreciate it. It's extremely early in the morning for you there in California. So thank you very much uh, for getting up early. No, no problem. The sun just finally rose, I think, <laughs> in the background. <laughs> we can see it in your picture. Yes, yeah, that's, that's how nice. Okay. Well, Arthur, thank you very much again. And thank you to everybody for joining in and listening and for sending in your questions. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, everyone. Bye-bye.